Welcome everyone. I'm Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement here at JTS, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you back after Thanksgiving to today's session of our fall series on dangerous ideas, censorship through a Jewish lens. A uh, special welcome to anyone who might be joining us for the first time today. Um, we are so pleased to have a new JTS faculty member, uh, Dr. Shira Billet, who is Assistant Professor of Jewish Thought and Ethics, joining us today. Um, it's very exciting when there's a new faculty hire and, um, you know, just kind of a fresh face on the scene on the cutting edge of research and thought. So we're really thrilled to have Professor Billet with us today, um, who's going to be doing our second of two sessions on Spinoza, um, but it should it should uh, work even if you weren't with us last week, um, but um, we'll be kind of adding to what um, what Dr. Ray did with us last week, um, and a lot of new material on sort of how how the reception of Spinoza has changed and how we think about um, what to do with dangerous ideas. So she will tell us much more. Um, I also want to announce that um, we had originally. Um, as you know, this, this series meets on Mondays. We originally had a, had a special Wednesday session scheduled for this week with Professor David Fishman um, because he was unable to do Mondays. And unfortunately, we have had to cancel that session. So uh, if you had that on your calendar, you should go ahead and take it off um, this, this Wednesday, November 30th. And we um, are very sad not to be able to learn with Professor Fishman um, but we will uh, definitely schedule him again in the future uh, for a future series. Um, I want to thank our sponsor for today uh, at the Navi level, Yale Aspel JTS trustee, who is an incredible supporter of, um, of JTS as a whole, but, um, but of our adult learning programs. Thank you so much, Yale. Excuse me. Um, and I hope that your your generosity will inspire others to do the same. We would love to have more sponsors. Um, we have three levels, Chacham, Tzadik, and Navi for um, $541,000 and $1,800 respectively. So you can learn more at the link in the chat and, um, and um, yeah, thank you in advance for your generosity, anyone who, uh, who is inspired by Yale and by our amazing faculty to sponsor a session. I'm going to turn it over now to Tani schwartz -Herman. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, I'll just review uh, the format of, of our session. Uh, Professor Billet will pause for questions periodically throughout the class and we'll also have some time at the end of the session for Q&A. Uh, you can use the chat feature to submit your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman. Um, and during the Q&A period, uh, Rabbi Andelman will select a few of the questions to present to Dr. Billet. For any technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with either myself or Ellie Gettinger. Um, the sources for today's class were in the email that you received uh, with the Zoom link this morning, and we'll be screen sharing them as well. Um, so please to introduce uh, Dr. Shira Billet, uh, Assistant Professor of Jewish Thought and Ethics at JTS. Um, Dr. Billet's research is focused on 19th century and early 20th century German Jewish philosophy. Her dissertation was on the German Jewish philosopher Hermann Kohn and offered an account of Hermann Kohn's understanding of the role of the Jewish philosopher within the political state. Dr. Billet's current book ma manuscript is centered around the virtues of courage, truthfulness, intellectual humi humility, and fidelity as public virtues within Hermann Kohn's work. Um, Dr. Billet has lectured and given papers at many institutions and academic conferences, um, and we're so, we're so pleased to have her teaching us today. Um, you can read her full bio um, in the sources that were, were shared with a link, um, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Billet. Thank you so much. Um... It's really a delight to be part of this series. And um, today we're going to learn something about um, the 18th to 9th, the, sorry, the 19th to 20th century German Jewish philosopher, Hermann Cohen. Um, he, as we'll learn, he was an extremely important figure in modern Jewish philosophy and also in modern um, Jewish history. And um, in particular, we're going to talk about his, 
um, reception of Spinoza. For those who were able to attend the previous session on Spinoza, um, you learned about the 17th century context in which um, the, the Jew Benedict Baruch Spinoza was um, put into cherem or was a, a ban was invoked upon him by the uh, Jewish community in Amsterdam where he lived because of idea, his ideas that, that they viewed as dangerous. And um, in the 200 years since that ban and since Spinoza lived, um, till the, to the time of Hermann Cohen, um, beginning in the mid to late uh, 19th century, Spinoza's star actually uh, fell and rose. Um, so not only did the Jewish community ban him in the 17th century, but his ideas were understood as dangerous also within the philosophical community. Spinoza was a philosopher. He was a brilliant philosopher. And um, not only did the Jews have a problem with his ideas, but um, Christian philosophers as well understood him to be an atheist, um, which was very problematic within philosophy in, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, but by the late 18th century, and certainly by the 19th century, this was no longer a problem, and Spinoza's philosophy came to be um, rehabilitated and recognized within the history of philosophy as extremely important, so much so that um, the famous philosopher Hegel, G.W.F. Hegel from the 19th century, um, declared that either you have Spinozism or no philosophy at all, um, and that's on the that's on the source sheet, but you don't need to look at that. Um, some of the passages, I'll, I'll I'll screen share the ones that are important. Otherwise, I'll just mention if something's on the source sheet, you can look at it later as well. So in the 19th century, Hegel could say you either have Spinozism or no philosophy at all. And in the 20th century, the French philosopher Henri Bergson would say every human being has two philosophies, um, his own and that of Spinoza. Again, a statement of how important Spinoza was viewed in the history of philosophy. And within Jewish history, Spinoza sim similarly had a, a rising star um, in the 19th century. And now I'm going to um, share my screen uh, to show you some images relating to that point. So here you can see um, from the New York Times on March 20th, 1927, um, you can see if you look all the way at the column on the right, ban against Spinoza revoked by Jews, philosopher excommunicated 271 years ago is reinstated at ceremony in Jerusalem. This is a reference to um, an event that took place in 1927 on Mount Scopus, where Yosef Klausner, um, a professor and philosopher at, at Hebrew University, in 1927 gave a famous lecture called The Jewish Character of Spinoza's Philosophy. And he famously officially revoked the ban on Spinoza that had been in place since the 17th century, including um, the Jewish ritual pronunciation of um, when a vow is revoked, saying, um, you are our brother, you are our brother, you are our brother, achinuata, 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 which was a very um, auspicious marker of Spinoza's uh, rise in prominence within the Jewish community. And going back earlier, um, back a century, um, you have um, this description by the um, prominent Jewish thinker, the prominent 19th century Jewish thinker, Shmuel David Lutzato, um, who wrote in his commentary on the Bible, Hamish Tadel, um, about Spinoza. This philosopher, whose name was once a curse in the land, rose up in this generation in fame and glory and praise, so that his books, which were previously forbidden, have been disseminated in this generation, and the name of the author is mentioned in, co in commendation and blessing, so that in these times his accolades have also been written in the holy tongue, that is, in Lashon HaKodesh, in, in, in Hebrew. Um, so a reference, again, to the fact that Spinoza's star had risen not only within philosophy, but also um, throughout the Jewish community. So I'm going to um, stop the screen share for a moment to now introduce Hermann Cohen into this scene.
So um, Luzzato had written those words in the mid 19th century and the, the ban on Spinoza was in this dramatic ceremony um, revoked by uh, Klausner in the early 20th century. But Cohen, about a decade before the ban on Spinoza was, um, was revoked on that, in that dramatic moment on Mount Scopus, Hermann Cohen, this German Jewish philosopher that I'm going to introduce to you, had actually um, written one of the harshest condemnations of Spinoza that had been written since, um, since the original ban on Spinoza. So we have 200 years in which Spinoza is slowly and slowly, slowly recovered. We have Jews and philosophers reclaiming him. And we have this puzzling moment where in 1915, Hermann Cohen published a scathing critique of Spinoza, um, both on philosophical and Jewish grounds. And I'm going to um, introduce Cohen's critique of Spinoza to you, but first I just wanted you to understand that it really cut against the grain of the historical moment um, for Judaism because, and within the history of philosophy. And first we're going to see the, the dramatic problem that Cohen had with Spinoza. And then I'm going to try to explain to you why it was that Cohen thought um, even in the 20th century, that um, Spinoza's ideas were still very dangerous. So I'll share my screen again. So here's um, from here's um, an obituary of Hermann Cohen um, from when he died in 1918. That appeared in the American in the English language American Jewish Chronicle and American Paper. I mentioned that he was German, but um, his he was famous throughout the world, even in his lifetime, among the Jews um, and it within and more narrowly within the philosophical community. Um, and and I wanted to show you this opening sentence of this obituary that appeared. Hermann Cohen, the greatest philosopher the Jewish people has produced since Spinoza, is dead. So the opening sentence of this obituary links Cohen to Spinoza as the greatest philosopher that the Jewish people had produced since Spinoza. But um, in some ways, and, and this was a common sentiment, by the way, about Cohen in this time among Jews, that he was the greatest philosopher that had been produced by the Jewish community since Spinoza. You'll see this sentiment um, in many places in the, in the 20th century. Um, the sentiment is ironic, though, because of exactly what I just mentioned, that Cohen himself um, really issued the harshest condemnation of Spinoza in, in 200 years, um, just a few years before his death. So here's an image of Herma, a painting, a portrait of Hermann Cohen on the left in his, in his older age. And on the right is a recently published translation into English of... Um, the 1915 monograph in which Cohen issued his harsh condemnation of Spinoza. And I put on the screen here the most famous passage, perhaps, from that text, where Cohen writes, when Spinoza, with merciless severity, makes his own nation, that is the Jews, the object of contempt, no voice rises in protest against this humanly incomprehensible betrayal. So Cohen refers to Spinoza's book that, um, again, those who were in the session last last time, um, the book is the, the Tractatus Theologico Politicus or the Theological Political Tractate. Spinoza's volume that he wrote on, on um, the separation of church and state, but mostly it was a book on biblical interpretation. And again, I refer you to the lecture of last time to, to learn more about um, that book, the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, I'm going to refer to it henceforth as the TTP. That's how it's referred to. Um, it was published by Spinoza in the 17th century. It, it, the predominant um, subject matter of the book was biblical interpretation, but Spinoza was interpreting the Bible with his own contemporary purpose in his own historical moment, which had to do with um, 
making an argument for the separation of church and state and for the free, a very early argument for the separation of church and state and for the freedom um, and, and for the separation of philosophy from religion. So um, in any case, in the part of the book that is about biblical interpretation, which again is the bulk of the book, um, those of you who were here last time will already know, and I'll review this a little bit, Spinoza also made some claims in his interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, of the Old Testament, um, he made some claims about contemporary Judaism, contemporary meaning in his own time, 17th century Jews and Judaism. And I'm going to go through those, some of those claims in a moment so that you'll understand why Cohen refers to Spinoza's book as constituting a humanly incomprehensible betrayal of the Jews. Oops. Sorry, I'm trying to turn to the next slide. All right, here we are. So this chapter, chapter three of the TTP, is the chapter that was the reading for the previous lecture. So again, this will be review perhaps for some of you and for others. Um, I'll just summarize the key points that are important in this context. In this chapter of the TTP, Spinoza went through the concept of um, the, the, the election of the Jews or, or, or Jewish chosenness. And he argued that um, to the extent that the Jews were ever chosen um, or were the chosen people of God, um, this was a reference to a purely historical moment um, to the moment when the Bible itself actually took place, um, to its actual to the actual historical reality of when there was um, an ancient Jewish state. That is what Spinoza says the election of the Jews referred to. He and here's a quote from the TTP: their election and their calling constituted consisted, sorry, only in the enduring prosperity of their state and in other temporal advantages. So when it said in scripture that no nation has gods as close to it as the Jews have God, that must be understood only with respect to the state and only concerning that time. So one of Spinoza's key arguments in that chapter, again, was to say that um, in the Bible, when it says things like the Jews are the chosen people or the Jews are, are the most special people to God, what that meant in the Bible, Spinoza says, referred only to um, their state, be, their ancient state being successful, their, uh, um, and it was successful in terms of temporal things, in terms of constituting a prosperous and um, safe um, political community. And Spinoza rejected any notion that there was anything special or chosen about the Jews um, beyond that historical moment. And in fact, when Spinoza was writing in the 17th century, that historical state had been long destroyed. And so from Spinoza's perspective, Jewish chosenness was long over. Um, and, and anything that the Bible says about the Jews was only a, a reference to this historical time period that was over. And um, Spinoza went on to say in that chapter that he needs to, after he's offered a certain reading of the biblical passages where it seems to say that the Jews are chosen, um, he, he now goes on to say towards the end of the chapter that he now needs to reply to other arguments which by which the Jews want to persuade themselves that the choice of the Hebrews was not for a time and in relation only to their state, but eternal. And he says... One of the chief arguments um, that the Jews use to, to describe themselves as the chosen people has to do with the survival of the Jews for, for generations and generations, even after their state was destroyed. The Jews were scattered everywhere and separated from all the nations, and yet they survived, and no other people has done this. Um, and and um, Spinoza says in the second half of this quote here, it's true. It's true that they have survived for many years in spite of being scattered and without a state, but that is nothing to wonder at. After they separated themselves so from all the nations that they have drawn the hatred of all men against themselves. Moreover, the hatred of the nations has done much to preserve them. So in this quote, 
Spinoza says that um, he's already argued that Jewish chosenness only referred to a particular historical moment in time that is long over. And he, explain, he explains that the best argument um, to suggest that it, it, it is still an ongoing thing, that the Jews are still the chosen people, is um, Jewish survival throughout history, especially throughout a history of suffering and persecution. The, the fact that the Jews survived where, where no one else has um, is an argument used to suggest that they are still chosen. But Spinoza says, no, there's a very clear historical explanation for that. And it's the fact that they have separated themselves from all the nations in a way that they've drawn hatred upon themselves. They've basically made themselves hateful to the other nations by being so different. And the fact that everyone hates them is what makes them survive. Um, the fact that everyone hates them is what makes them survive. And another thing that makes them survive, said Spinoza, was um, the fact that they hate the other nations. So Spinoza basically says, the Jews are hated, um, but it's their own fault, essentially. They've drawn this hatred upon themselves, and also the Jews hate the nations. And um, it's through this complete isolation from the rest of the world that their survival can be explained. I'm going to, um, oh, sorry. I, I wanted to share my screen again. Um, in a moment, I'm going to share my screen again in a moment. Um, so Cohen is writing in, um, 1915 and he has a really big problem with these statements that Spinoza made about, um, the election of the Jews. And I'm going to explain why in a moment. Cohen, um, and in order to explain, I want to just tell you a little bit about Cohen's background. So Cohen was born in 1842 in a small town in Germany. And um, in, in the mid-1870s, he became the first and the only professor of philosophy at a German university who was a, a, a professing Jew, meaning he um, anyone else who was a Jew in such a position had converted to Christianity. Um, it was essentially impossible for a Jew to, to become a philosophy professor at a German university in that era. It was a heavily guarded field and Jews were not considered um, able to um, be successful in that profession and certainly not to be honored with um, the, the honorific of, of being a, a philosopher. Um, but in the mid 1870s, Spino uh, Cohen, sorry, um, achieved this this um, unprecedented role through a combination of historical circumstances and through um, the success of his of his philosophical work. In that era, he was writing philosophical commentaries on um, the German, the famous German philosopher of the previous century, Immanuel Kant. OK, the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, and he was also writing um, new, innovative ideas about how to study the history of philosophy. And um, Cohen became a professor and he um, and he worked in this small town, in this small university town um, called Marburg. He was at the University of Marburg. There were very, very few Jews in the entire town. Um, certainly at the time that Cohen started, and even two decades later, um, the Jewish community was a tiny, tiny percentage. There were only a few hundred Jews in the, in, in the entirety of Marburg, which had about um, 15, 16,000 um, residents at the time. And um, shortly after Cohen achieved this position, there, which was a, a really wonderful feather in his cap and a, and a great achievement for a Jew in that time, um, there was a dramatic uptick in anti-Semitism in Germany altogether. Um, basically, starting in the mid to late 1870s, um, anti-Semitism rose dramatically and unprecedentedly um, in Germany and German-speaking lands. 
And um, for Cohen, this was something he had not seen in his lifetime. He had not experienced this kind of anti-Semitism in his entire upbringing, um, in his 30 something years, um, 30 to 40 years, as he saw um, beginning in the mid to late 1870s. So I mentioned this context. And, and one last thing I'll say about it is this anti-Semitism that was on the rise was um, took place in several different spaces. One was politics. There was a dramatic rise in political parties that had that gained power and popularity that had um, anti-Semitism in their official platform and even in the party name, like the, the anti-Semitic party of Germany kind of thing. These were political parties that were proudly and overtly um, anti-Semitic and they were gaining in popularity. Additionally, within the academy, within scholarship, there was a rise in the production of scholarship that was also anti-Semitic and that um, described Jews in, in really negative light, including among um, scholars that had previously been understood to be liberal and to be um, open to um, the Jews becoming a more integrated part of German society. So the Jewish community in this time view this as a huge betrayal because they, and also just as a shock because they, um, they expected this from conservatives who were against um, any kind of change in society. They expected it from those who they, whom they experienced as, um, as not wanting to integrate Jews into the political community, but from those whom they associated with the um, position of wanting to integrate Jews into the German community, it, it was quite shocking to, to see these sorts of ideas being published in very mainstream presses and at mainstream universities. So it's within this context that Cohen starts to become extremely worried about Spinoza's um, 17th century book on the Bible. Now, why is Cohen so worried about a book that was published in the 17th century? Um, so we already saw that that book contained this notion um, that the Jews hate the Gentiles and also that the Gentiles hate the Jews, but it's, it's the Jews' own fault. Um, but okay, the book was written in the 17th century. Why, why are we worrying about that in, um, in the late 1870s? And why are we worrying about that in 1915 when Cohen wrote his scathing attack on Spinoza? So I want to um, read one more passage from, I want to show you one more passage from um, Spinoza's text. Um, and then we're going to try to explain why Spin Cohen is so worried about the TTP in um, the late 18th, in, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Okay, so um, this is the passage that we just saw. And here I want to show you a passage from chapter five of the TTP. Those passages that we saw before were from chapter three. In this chapter, Spinoza specifically talks about um, the, the quote unquote Jewish ceremonies by which he, he refers to Jewish ritual or Jewish, Jewish law, basically halakha, um, the, the kind of practices that constituted the daily life of Jews um, and uh, around which Jewish life into the contemporary moment, into Spinoza's contemporary moment was organized. So he, of these ceremonies, Spinoza wrote, ceremonies, at least those treated in the Old Testament, were instituted only for the Hebrews and were so adapted to their state that for the most part, they could be performed only by the whole society, not by each person. So it's certain that they do not pertain to the divine law and make no contribution to blessedness and virtue, but concern only the election of the Hebrews, that is, only the temporal happiness of the body and the peace of the state. For that reason, they could be useful only so long as their state lasted. So what Spinoza is saying here about Jewish law is that Jewish law was only was basically the law of the ancient Hebrew state. It was a collective law. It had nothing. It, it made no sense to be practiced on an individual level by individual by by an individual in the privacy of their own home or their own life. And furthermore, these laws are not about virtue. 
They're not about morality. What they were about was something political. They were the laws of an ancient state, of a state that was successful. They were about um, the happiness and the peace of the state. And they were only relevant as long as the state lasted. And Spinoza says more things in that chapter about um, the political nature of, of Jewish law, um, which had a, which um, with respect again to contemporary Judaism was an argument that um, the continuance of Jewish law by the continuance of the practice of Jewish law by Jews past the time that their state was destroyed made no sense. Those laws were only um, instituted for the, the state they were not meant to be practiced by individuals. They only made sense in the context of a state, and um, the, any and and they're not. Um, they don't have a kind of lasting universal message that transcends the political. They're not laws that contribute to virtue. They're not laws that are about ethics. They are about the success of this ancient state. So taken together, this is basically an argument that. Um, that Judaism really ended in the ancient past, that Judaism ended when the Jewish state in the ancient past was destroyed, and that the ongoing practice of that religion by Jews was essentially an anachronism. And um, it was, and when they when they say that there's something special about them, it's really false and there's nothing special about the religion. And also um, when they practice these rules, when, when individual Jews practice halakha in, or, or Jewish legal practices in the modern period, um, again, they are, they are doing something that, that basically makes no sense. So there's all sorts of reasons why um, in the late 18th and early, it, sorry, I keep saying the late 18th, in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, Cohen is worried about these ideas in Spinoza. He's not worried so much because um, he feels the need to defend halakha as a, as a kind of guiding practice of Jewish daily life, but he's worried because he thinks that these ideas are extremely dangerous um, for contemporary Jews. So let's take a look at um, the next slide. We're Cohen states this where Cohen states this quite um, explicitly. He says, Spinoza represents a grave impediment to modern Jewish history and therefore a great misfortune ever since Lessing, sorry for the typo, that should say Lessing with an N, ever since Lessing and Herder, these are prominent um, 18th and 19th century German philosophers, ever since Lessing and Herder placed Spinoza on a pedestal, and that's part of that recovery of Spinoza that I mentioned earlier, he and his Tractatus, that's the TTP, have become the authentic source of biblical and rabbinic Judaism in the modern world. So now we see why Cohen is worried. The fact that Spinoza has become so respected in the philosophical community meant that his Tractatus, even though it was a his the TTP, even though it was a 17th century text, it was it continued to be an authentic source of how to understand biblical and rabbinic Judaism by philosophers and by modern people more broadly. Next quote on this slide: This book came to be regarded as the confession um, of crown witness. Sorry to interrupt you. You're you're not actually sharing right now. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, Okay, sorry. Um, let me go back to the previous slide here. So the first quote is the one I just read a moment ago. The second quote is the one I was in the middle of. This book came to be regarded as the confession of a crown witness who, by virtue of his philosophical genius and expertise in the field of Judaism, possessed unassailable authority. So the thing Cohen worries about is that um, the very fact that Spinoza has become what he became, um, again, the most important philosopher, essentially, as those quotes that I shared earlier um, from Hegel and Henri Bergson, et cetera, talking about the importance of Spinoza, um, the fact that he had become such an important philosopher and he was a Jew, 
and he was a learned Jew at that. And then he wrote these things about Judaism that made him an extremely authoritative source of Judaism. So even contemporaries in the 19th century, contemporaries of Cohen in the 19th and 20th century who wanted to understand Judaism, Cohen's argument is that they turn to Spinoza. He's viewed as an extremely authoritative source of um, and any understanding of Judaism. And Cohen worries about this because he's looking around him and he's seeing the dramatic rise of anti-Semitism. And he's um and he thinks there's a direct line from Spinoza to this. So much so that I will um show you one last um passage on this point from Cohen. He says. The pithy sayings Spinoza employed to vent his vengeful hatred of the Jews can be found even now almost verbatim in the newspapers of those contemporary anti-Semitic political camps. Again, a reference to those political parties that I mentioned before. And not only that, what Cohen finds extra problematic when he reads the TTP is he thinks that Spinoza did this intentionally, meaning he thinks that Spinoza should have understood how dangerous um, his views would be for Jews, for both for contemporary Jews in his own lifetime and for Jews um, in the future. And Cohen sees this as extremely problematic, that not only were these ideas dangerous for Jews and, and um, harmful to them politically, but that Spinoza should have understood that and seen that and um, and and from Cohen's perspective, this is a huge problem. So I'm going to pause for questions in a moment. Um, I just want to say that in the next part of the lecture, I want to talk about um, Spinoza, Cohen's substantive problem with Spinoza's reading of the Hebrew Bible. Up until this point, I've kind of shown that um, Cohen had a huge political problem with Spinoza's reading of the Bible. He saw it as dangerous for contemporary Jews. He saw it as a source of anti-Semitism. And, and, and in a moment when anti-Semitism was genuinely on the rise and when Jews were genuinely feeling um, the pain of it, he looked at Spinoza and he, and he really worried about, um, about his impact. And he says, um, even though people like his ideas now, his philosophical ideas, and even many of his, of his Jewish ideas, we need to pay close attention to these particular statements of his and to and to recognize um, how problematic they are and to and to recognize that Spinoza um, committed, as I mentioned earlier, what Cohen calls a humanly incomprehensible betrayal. Um, oftentimes, people who care about Cohen's reading of Spinoza don't look past the part that I've shown you. They just focus on that he reinvoked the ban, that he issued these really harsh statements about Spinoza just at a moment when everyone was recovering Spinoza and interested in him. And they mention something about the, anti the context of anti-Semitism. What I'm going to do in the continuation of this talk is to show you a, a, a substantive um, the substantive aspect of Spinoza's problem, of Cohen's sorry problem with how Spinoza read the Bible, that isn't just about contemporary politics, but is something broader that will um, help us understand something about the history of, of, of Jewish philosophy, both of modern Jewish philosophy and really of Jewish philosophy historically. So that's the next piece. Um, but first, I, I want to pause for questions. Thank you. We have so many interesting questions. Um, okay, let's start with this. So Cohen um, characterizes Spinoza as, as having vengeful hatred of the Jews. Um, do you think that that's an accurate characterization? So, okay, I, I, I don't take a stance on this, but, I'm, um, but I will say that th this is a huge uh, subject of debate. Um, and I would say that most people don't think that that he's right on this point. However, um, what I the part that I care about kind of sharing here is that um, when Cohen wrote those words, he wasn't just um, making stuff up. He had just read a, a new biography of Spinoza that had come out in 1904. 
by the um, Jewish scholar of Spinoza, Jakob Freudenthal, who, by the way, did not think that Spinoza hated the Jews, but he did think that Spinoza was really unfair to the Jews in the TTP. Um, and Cohen has a whole argument about hatred and, and what hatred means and how you can identify hatred. So this, I'll just say that this is a broader, I'll just kind of flag that there's a broader, a broader scholarly discourse on this topic. Um, I don't, I'm not a scholar of Spinoza. I, I, I kind of accept um, what the common sentiment seems to be that Cohen is a little too extreme here. Um, but, but I would just say that um, he's, he's basing what he says on historical material, not just um, this Jewish biography, this not Jewish, but this, but this biography of Spinoza from 1904 by, by a, a Jewish scholar of Spinoza, but also um, a non-Jewish scholar of Spinoza named Carl Gebhardt, um, pub, was instrumental to the recovery of Spinoza in the 19th century by publishing critical editions of Spinoza's writings and translations into German of Spinoza's writings. And he um, wrote a biographical introduction to his um, critical edition of the TTP, in which he also talked about how um, Spinoza's ideas about the Jews are um, quite unfair. Um, and again, Cohen was reading these things and, and piecing things together, but um, it's a it's a pretty strong statement to make. And 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 I think Cohen would need a lot more evidence to really um, support that claim. Thank you. Um, so there were there were a few questions uh, asking about. Um, is, is isn't Spinoza's view sort of similar to this other view? So I'm going to share a couple of those, and then and then there's questions about Cohen as well. Um, but so one question is um, that there's there's potentially a similarity, a kind of odd similarity here to um, the thread of Zionism that talks about you know that Judaism can sort of only only be practiced properly um, in a Jewish homeland, and that's why we need a that's so why we need a state. So it's, it's obviously um, it's employing, you know, sort of a similar line of thought with a, a very different goal, but it's an interesting observation. And then another person asked, um, how is his interpretation of, of Jewish law and ritual different from 19th century um, reform thinkers who wanted to reject the idea of ritual law as being entirely separate from ethical law? Great. So first of all, on the connection to Zionism, so it's not incidental that it was on Mount Scopus in 1927 that that ban that that um, ceremony of of um, revoking the ban in this very official way was performed again by Klausner, um, because Zionists, early Zionists really did like Spinoza, um, both for the reason that was described, kind of the notion that that where Judaism was at was not in the diaspora. That was not authentic Judaism, but it was in the context of a political state. And um, this kind of rejection of the diaspora. And But even more specifically, this may have been pointed out in the lecture last time, but if not, it was in that chapter that was the reading for last time. Spinoza has this very strange statement that he makes in, in, in proving his point about the temporal election is he makes this strange claim that um, given how successful he thinks the Jews, um, Jewish separation has been at preserving the Jews historically, and given how much as a historian he observes that human affairs can change so dramatically and unexpectedly, he says he doesn't think it's impossible that the Jews could once again rise up and reconquer their land and once again be materially successful and chosen in the context of a political state, he says so changeable are human affairs. Um, now, did Spinoza think that would actually happen? Undoubtedly, he did not think that would actually happen, um, but he kind of legitimated the, 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 that as a historical possibility. And, and again, referred to chosenness as, as something tempor temporal that only happens in the context of, of states. And Zionists really jumped up on this. And there's other things. Um, again, this is, a, this is a, a broader topic, not, not really my topic for today, but there are all sorts of connections. In that same passage, Spinoza says, that um, if not for the fact that their religion makes them unmanly, 
I would imagine that they could rise up, that, that they could one day rise up again and reconquer their state. And there's a whole discourse within Zionism about um, this notion called muscular Judaism, or the idea of a very gendered component about Judaism in the diaspora was unmanly, was weak. Um, and this Zionism wanted to reclaim a kind of manly and, and physically strong aspect of Judaism. So there are all sorts of other affinities between Spinoza and Zionism. And so that observation is, is, um, is an important one. With respect to the other question about um, these critiques of Jewish law as, as basically only being relevant in the context of the ancient state and, and having no relevance today as having similarities to um, contemporary, to then contemporary reformers of Judaism. There's for sure some overlap. And, um, and yet at the same time, those, those Jews who wanted to reform Judaism oftentimes had a very strong alternative understanding of Judaism, which was as a kind of an ethical system or as a, as a, as a, um, something as a source in the, in the world of a concept called ethical monotheism, um, as basically having been a source of a crucial idea that contributed to, um, ethics in the world. And so those same thinkers who rejected law still affirmed a really important contribution of Judaism to the to history and to the world. And um, the problem that Cohen sees, and we'll talk about this in a moment, is that for Spinoza, the rejection of Jewish law and the rejection of anything ethical in Judaism um, come hand in hand, because Spinoza says that Judaism altogether has no meaning or purpose outside of that historical moment of the state, because you can't even reframe those laws as ethical monotheism. I mean, he wouldn't have used that term ethical monotheism. It wasn't invented until later, until after the 17th century. But um, this point has broader implications than just rejecting law in favor of some other positive meaning of Judaism. It was the idea that um, that the whole thing is an anachronism after that historical moment. Thank you. Do you, um, you, you take one or two more? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, someone was asking about, um, about Cohen's own experience and I'll just, I'll just read this um, verbatim. So did Herman Cohen have reason to believe that he himself suffered from anti-Semitism in the academy as a result of the rise of Spinoza among non-Jewish philosophers, I guess the kind of the popularity of Spinoza among non-Jewish philosophers. And uh, if so, could that personal, ex sorry, personal experience have affected his analysis of Spinoza's TTP? Okay, great question. And it's actually also a great segue into the next part of the lecture. Um, so if there's another question, um, maybe you could also say that because I might reverse order the answers so that I can kind of segue into the next piece for that one. Why don't you go ahead and segue, and I'll and I'll save um, I'll save the rest for the next uh, the next Q and A. Okay, great. So um, the answer, the short answer to that is is um, Spino Cohen did experience anti-Semitism within the academy, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But really, he had no reason to connect that to Spinoza at all. Um, until until a much later point. And so I'm I'm going to kind of trace a history of Cohen coming to identify um, Spinoza in particular as a as a really problematic text. But I, I'll just say briefly, and this is also a subject, a broader subject of scholarship for those who are more interested. Cohen had a pretty positive view of Spinoza earlier on in his life. Um, and then he came to philosophically reject Spinoza's philosophy unrelated to his book on, on the Bible, unrelated to his writings about Judaism. Spinoza's most important philosophical text was called The Ethics, um, uh, the, or um, whatever, it was written in Latin, but translated into English, um, The Ethics. Um, and that book has nothing to do with Judaism, um, although some scholars who who want to kind of argue that Spinoza really is a Jewish philosopher do do identify um, important Kabbalistic and other Jewish ideas in Spinoza's philosophy. But that's, again, a topic for another time. So um, Cohen was an 
was a lifelong, almost lifelong critic of Spinoza's ethics um, in that he cared a lot about philosophical ethics. And he thought that there are a, a variety of reasons why Spinoza's strategy for how to write a philosophical ethics was the wrong one. And he favored a, a, a Kantian as opposed to a Spinozistic approach to ethics. Um, that so he had he had an early appreciation of Spinoza's philosophy. Then, relatively early on in his philosophical career, he came to think that Spinoza's philosophy was problematic for ethics. Um, and but he it was always a very civil dispute, a dispute about the ideas. If we care about ethics, which system is is better? Which system works? Which system doesn't work? What's what are the um, problems? Um, uh, what are the flaws that, or the logical errors or um, the the failures um, of Spinoza's ethical system to achieve its aim of of ethics? So that was kind of most of Spino most of Cohen's engagement with Spinoza for many many years. It's only actually after he reads those biographical texts that I mentioned before, that he starts really looking at and caring about the TTP and Spinoza's reading of the Bible. So it's only late in his life that Spinoza, that Cohen turns in a really deep way to Spinoza's reading of the Bible and, and issues that criticism. But it seems mostly to be because he didn't really, um, as a philosopher, the TTP, which is mostly a book about biblical interpretation, was just not the important Spinoza book that philosophers read. The important Spinoza book was the book on the ethics. But what I want to show you in a moment is um, the history of how Cohen did um, face anti-Semitism on a personal level, and um, and the and the reason why, when he did ultimately come to pay attention to the TTP, why he was primed to really see it as a, as a very problematic text. So um, so just to that questioner, there will be, in what follows, there will be more um, information that I think will help answer your question. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, I'm trying to find my, is this, do you see my slideshow? Not yet. Yes? Yep, now we see it. Okay. So um, what I want to say now is that um, if we pay attention to the issue of biblical interpretation, to the issue of how the Bible should properly be interpreted, we will come to see that um, Cohen's dispute with Spinoza was about much more than are his ideas um, kind of important sources of anti-Semitic ideas in the late 19th and early 20th century, but is about really some of the most basic question, the most basic question in a sense of Jewish philosophy and also of modern Judaism, which is what is the proper way to read the Bible? What is the proper way to read the Torah? And um, I'm going to take a step back for a moment to say that in the in that book, the TTP, chapter seven, um, is is called on the on biblical interpretation or on the interpretation of the Bible. And in that book, Spinoza outlines his method for how he reads the Bible. Um, and it's a really serious method. In fact, it's often viewed as one of the found as as a founding moment of modern Bible criticism. So, um, anyone who thinks that the develop the the um, scholarly developments in our interpretation of the Bible in the nineteenth and twentieth century are um, important and groundbreaking and um, meritorious, well, they owe some debt to Spinoza because Spinoza came along and said, um, you need a really rigorous philological method for how to read the Bible. And in order to read the Bible properly, you need to um, know the Hebrew language really well. You need to create a history of this document and to understand the possibilities of what words could mean in its own context. Um, 
And, and ultimately, this was a founding moment of modern biblical philology and of modern philology more broadly. And in fact, Spino Cohen, sorry, really recognizes um, Spinoza's contribution to that history. Even in his late life, when he is very angry at Spinoza, he still recognizes the important contribution that Spinoza made to biblical philology. And I'll just say that Cohen was trained um, before he became a philosopher. He studied at um, he studied as a teenager at um, a prominent institution of the academic study of Judaism, which was a rabbinical training seminary, actually, um, the Jewish Theological Seminary of Breslov, um, which uh, is the namesake of um, the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. So he studied at this institution in the 1850s. And, um, and that was a place where rigorous, philological methods were being used for studying the Bible and um, Jewish sources more broadly. And Spinoza was considered a hero in that place for, for having introduced these, these methods of, of, of using history um, to study the Bible. And, and Cohen recognizes that contribution throughout his life. But what Cohen comes to find really problematic when he, when he closely reads the TTP late in his life is that he thinks that Spinoza thinks that the only thing that tells us the meaning of the Bible is philology. The only thing is um, creating a history of the context of, um, of the Bible and of the words and kind of plugging it, plugging this almost like an algorithmically um, to, to understand the meaning of the text. And Cohen says, if you actually read the Bible, you see that the Bible is such a complex document. It's got poetry, it's got prose, it's got myth, it's got history, um, it's constantly changing genres, it's doing so many different things. And to think that just philology alone will tell you what the meaning of that document is, Cohen thinks that's very short-sighted. And um, if you look at the passages I have um, on my screen now, you can see Spinoza uh, Cohen talking about this. He, on the first quote, he says, philology has good val value in relation to the meaning of words, but becomes folly when it remains the guiding principle for understanding the content of the ideas in a historical source. This is something he wrote in, in a 19, this is something that he said in a 1910 lecture that he gave on Spinoza um, that he never published in his lifetime. And um, he says similar things in the um, 1915 published text in the second quote here. I'm not going to read it, but it's on the, the source sheet for those who want to look at it later. So um, I want to share with you now um, some of the background for how um, Cohen came to think in more nuanced and complicated ways about philology and about its relationship to philosophy. And these are these are notions that he ultimately applies when he reads Spinoza's TTP in, in towards the end of his life, but they have a much longer history in his lifetime, independent of any engagement with Spinoza. In the 19th century, um, Cohen, one of Cohen's philosophical contributions more broadly was um, the articulation of a, of a method for how philosophers, should engage with the study of historical texts and how they should read historical texts rigorously, both from a philological perspective, but also from a philosophical perspective. And the first quote that I have on this slide here is um, a statement that Cohen wrote in a very early um, philosophical publication of his, where he wrote, let the historian be a philosopher. He is offering a method for how philosophy and history need to work together. And I'm going to explain to you why this, be, I'm going to explain to you in a moment how this became so important for his Jewish philosophy. But when he wrote this statement in 1871, it had nothing to do with Judaism. He was writing about the history of 
of philosophy and of Kant interpretation and of Plato. He, he was writing something um, within the history of philosophy, but I'm going to show you in a moment how he came to apply this notion to his study of Judaism. In this same early source where he said that the historian should become a philosopher, Cohen said that the goal, this is the next quote on the slide, the goal of the history of philosophy is to represent the continuous connection of philosophical problems within the whole of human culture. So Cohen thinks that human history and human culture is something that has a continuous connection, that all of human, all of humans in history um, are, are part of some continuous thing that historians can, can study um, by looking at historical texts but it's only philosophers who can identify the real connections between people from each past moment, um, from one to another, to another, to another. And it's only philosophers who can show the continuities within human history. And he claims that this is the goal of the history of philosophy. And specifically, the last quote that I have on that slide, which I'll put back up, is um, the task of the method is to grasp what he calls in German, the Grundgedanken. So he says that um, what the philosopher who studies- Dr. Villa, so yes. sorry to interrupt you. I just noticed that you think you're in the presenter view. Oh, sorry. Can, can you see this? Yes, yes, thank okay. you. So, um, the philosopher who, who identifies these continuous connections within the whole of human culture, who, who shows the continuities within history, does so by way of um, identifying, and again, I put the German term here, the Grundgedanken, which means the basic ideas. What a philosopher does who studies history needs to look at these complex historical texts and identify what is the basic idea, what is the the, the core contribution that this text is making, what is the core idea that, that can be kind of distilled from this text? And then can I find the same core idea in the next generation and in the next generation? And that it's those core ideas that are the key um, links in the chain of human history and of human culture that show us how, um, each generation is connected to the next one. And this is something Cohen articulated in the context of a history of philosophy. Um, and it was a very um, controversial, but also promising idea that gained him popularity. And when he first wrote this, this was before he got that job at Marburg. And, and this, this um, new method of studying the history of philosophy was one of the things that impressed some people about him and that helped him um, get that job as a philosophy professor later. Now, fast forward a bunch of years. So Cohen's got this idea of, um, of combining history and philology and philosophy. And he thinks it's crucial for our understanding of human history and it's crucial for our understanding of the history of philosophy. And then we've got this anti-Semitism going on, okay? And, um, and it's building up in the late 1870s into the 1880s. And in fact, in the university town where Cohen lived and worked, um, one of those political parties that I mentioned earlier kind of had its like um, its home base because the figure that that party centered around, his name was Otto Buckel. He was from Marburg and he had gone to the university. And so the town was actually associated with him. And in 1886, there was a rally, an anti-Semitic rally in this small town. And at the rally, someone, um, one of the speakers had stated publicly that um, Judaism was an unethical religion because the Talmud says that Jews um, don't have to treat non-Jews the same way that they have to treat Jews. That, that basically the Talmud has different rules for treating Jews and non-Jews. And that means that Judaism has a particularistic morality, only a morality that applies to fellow Jews, not a universalistic morality that applies to all human beings. Therefore, the Talmud is unethical and therefore Judaism is unethical. So that was in 1886, a public statement at a rally. And in 1888, the Jewish community of Marburg 
um, brought a libel trial against the person who had made that statement because they said, you are slandering our religion. You're saying our religion is unethical. And, um, and there was a law on the books against slandering um, any religion that was incorporated within the state. And, um, and they recognized how bad it was for these ideas to be disseminated. So there's now there's a trial in Marburg in, in 1888. And Cohen is this local professor. He's a philosophy professor, but he's also the town, one of the town's most prominent Jews. And he gets asked to be an expert witness. Um, and his job is to basically say, well, is it true? Is the Talmud unethical? Is Judaism unethical? And um, because in order for this statement to be slander, it has to not, it, it has to not just say bad things about Judaism, but it has to be false. Um, and so Cohen suddenly gets kind of thrown into this very um, public and political situation where he's talking now about Judaism, which is not what he did in his daily life. Again, his daily life, he's teaching classes on Kant, on Plato, writing articles, writing books. Um, and it's in this context that he applies the method that I just mentioned before about bringing together history and philosophy um, to the study of Judaism. And um, let's see if I can share my screen again um, to show you more about this. Um, so here we are. This is um, the courthouse. This is a, a sketch of the courthouse in Marburg where Cohen gives his, his testimony in 1888. And um, basically, Cohen's got a little problem. The problem is, well, the Talmud does contain some statements that oppose universal ethics. Um, for example, the Talmud says that you don't have to return the lost object of a Gentile, only of a Jew. OK, so then the question is, um, do these state do these problematic statements mean that the Talmud is unethical? Cohen, in order to answer this question, Cohen decides to apply the method that he had developed within the history of philosophy to say that the, the, the key to answering this question is not, is there a statement that says, that says this or that, but rather, um, is the Talmud unethical? That's a, that's a philosophical question. That's not a historical question of, is this statement there or is that statement there? And to answer this philosophical question, you need to know the, those Grundgedanken. You need to identify the basic ideas of the Talmud. In other words, you need to read the Talmud philosophically. And Cohen basically in his expert testimony does this. And he argues that um, if you read the Talmud philosophically and if you look for its core basic ideas, you will see that it's not unethical at all. The opposite, it's actually, um, its basic ideas are quite ethical. It does contain some statements that go against universal ethics. And Cohen thinks that um, in order to read historical sources in the contemporary moment, the key thing that we want to, if we're just a philologist, then, then we care about does it, what does this statement mean? What does that statement mean? But if we care about the continuous connections in human history, and if we care about what this document truly means in terms of its core ideas, then we want to read it philosophically. We want to read in terms of not this incidental statement or that incidental statement here and there. We want to understand these this notion of the Grundgedanken. And again, this was something that Cohen um, had articulated in the context of the history of philosophy. And now he's applying it for the first time to Jewish sources. Now, um, when Cohen comes to read the TTP late in his life, he has this history in mind. And so to answer the question of the questioner before, I'll say that the most anti-Semitism that Cohen personally experienced was after he testified in this trial. Um, his colleagues were not happy that he had kind of publicly done this thing. In the, and remember, it was a small town um, and everything that people were doing was, was very public and very known. And he was supposed to be this German philosopher the fact that he was a Jew was supposed to be um, okay, something that that was um, true about him, but it was kind of um, something that everyone bracketed when they had given him the job to begin with, and it wasn't something that anyone wanted on display or or prominent. And suddenly, here he is. He serves as an expert witness in this local trial. And he wrote in a letter after the trial um, to a friend that when he would now when he would walk into the faculty room in his department, 
everyone would leave the second he walked in the door. And that in general, he was kind of shunned by his colleagues after he did this thing. And it was really from then on that he that people started saying things like his philosophical work was Judaizing Kant. Um, there was a famous incident that happened late in his life where he was accused of, of being a Judaizer of Kant and, and of his and, and of his philosophy as essentially being a, 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 a Judaic um, imposition on the history of philosophy. But none of that really happened before this 1888 um, moment when he when he um, applied his method to Jewish sources. And so now I want to come back to Spinoza. Can you see, is this presenter view or can you see the, um, my uh, it's, slideshow? It's, it's, no, it's good. It's easier. Yourself. Okay, great. So Cohen's main dispute with Spinoza, if you study his 1915 text really carefully, is actually much more about this, about the proper way to read the Bible and about trying to articulate a more expansive view than a merely philological view, but rather a view that combines philology and philosophy. And um, so I have here on the slide, which history is the Bible's history? Spinoza says, and here, if you look on the handout that I, on the source sheet that was sent around this morning, um, if you look at the section on um, section three called, entitled Cohen's Substantive Dispute with Spinoza, I'm not going to put it up now, but you could look at it later. You'll see a lot of quotations from Spinoza's TTP where he articulates his method of reading the Bible. And he says that you need to that to be a philologist and to study the Bible in a serious, rigorous way, you need to study it only in terms of its own history, which is a very um, literal history, a history of the words and whatever little information we have about the ancient context. And Cohen has a much more expansive understanding of history. He thinks that history is, of course, that. It is the history that Spinoza talks about. It is the history of an immediate historical context of a source of a text. It is the history of knowing the words and what they mean and what their possibilities are in the context in which they were written. But he also sees this thing that I mentioned earlier, the continuous connection of ideas um, from one human generation to another. And there he thinks that we need to have a much more expansive understanding of history that includes not just philology, but also culture, also the history of literature. And we need to find the continuities within that history. In other words, Cohen thinks that in order to properly understand the Bible and the Talmud, and actually really any historical source, Jewish or not, you can't just read it philologically. You must read it philologically, but you can't just stop there. You have to also then read it in terms of its own subsequent history of how it develops, because that will help you see which core ideas get preserved from generation to generation to generation. And those core ideas will show you what were, he argues that if you do that kind of history, you'll see what the most important ideas were in the original text in its original time. It's the ones that get preserved from generation to generation that Cohen thinks are even in the original source, um, the most important ideas. And you can't know that without studying the subsequent history of the source, he says. And um, in some ways, there's something um, quite traditional, even though Cohen was in no means a traditionalist about reading, there's something quite traditional about this method because it says you need to see how subsequent generations interpreted a text. And Cohen basically thinks that Spinoza when he stated his method of reading the Bible, which says that you can only read the Bible in terms of its the words that are in it and what they mean in that exact historical moment in which it was written, he thinks it's a really narrow conception of history and it separates any possibility of seeing a deeper meaning in these texts that has a trans-historical meaning. And we already saw that Spinoza says that about Judaism. He says Judaism's meaning is only about the time period in which these texts were referring to. It doesn't have a meaning that transcends that time. And Cohen thinks that philosophy, when you read a source philosophically, you actually see a meaning within texts 
that does transcend their historical moment and give them an afterlife and give them meaning beyond the moment in which they were written. Now, the last thing I want to end on before I open for another um, section of questions is to talk about Cohen versus Spinoza on um, whether the uh, on on how we understand the kind of rational capacities and the dignity of the common human being, of of you know the regular um, non philosopher, you and me, right? Uh, just all of us and 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 human beings more broadly. Um, so I'm going to conclude with with this um, point that um, this there's a an important debate basically between um, Spinoza and Maimonides um, that Cohen enters into here. When Spinoza articulates his method for reading the Bible and saying you can only read it philologically, you can only read it on its own terms without any kind of philosophical or external source helping you understand what it means, his chief target in the TTP, in chapter seven of the TTP, is Maimonides. I've got the, the famous image of Maimonides on the left here, that, that famous Jewish philosopher who read the Bible philosophically. You know, famously, famously, Maimonides says there are passages in the Bible which seem to indicate that God has a body. And those that goes against reason, that goes against any um, possibility that we know from, from rational philosophical thought. And the Bible can't possibly mean that, it can't possibly mean that God has, has a body. It must be that we are supposed to interpret those passages allegorically. And Spinoza says, this is absurd. You need to, you can only interpret things allegorically if you, if you are given a clue from the Bible itself that you need to read them allegorically. You can't um, do that just because it contradicts with philosophy. In other words, you can't use philosophy to read the Bible. That's Spinoza against Maimonides. But Spinoza says even more that he is, that, that Maimonides' view is elitist. Because according to Maimonides' view, the common human being who reads the Bible wouldn't be able to understand it because they wouldn't know um, the deeper philosophical meanings that it harbors in its in its um, in its true meaning. So they would read the texts that seem to indicate that God has a body, and they would be totally wrong about the meaning of the Bible. And they would need some authoritative figure, like a philosopher, to come along and explain to them what it means. And Spinoza says that's wrong. The common human being should be able to read the Bible on his or her own terms. And so on the one hand, Spinoza seems to be kind of a, a populist fighting against the elitism of Maimonides because he says that the common human being should be able to read the Bible. On the flip side, if you read Spinoza's text, he basically says that the Bible is an extremely simple document that has an extremely simple message, basically. And the reason the common human being could understand it is because um, it's just really not that complicated. The Bible's basic meaning is love God, love your neighbor as yourself and be obedient to the authorities. That's what Spinoza says is the basic meaning of the Bible and everything else is just um, to kind of get at that point. Cohen enters into this debate and he says, he wants to dignify the common human being just like Spinoza does, but he also wants to say that you need a philosopher to help you interpret the Bible. And that's because he thinks that human beings in history have always produced philosophical ideas in their texts. Even if they weren't philosophers, there have always been core crucial ideas in human texts produced throughout history that are profound and true and universally true and transcend time and space. And the problem, though, is that it's only when philosophers read these ancient historical or medieval or whatever, it's only when philosophers read these texts with their ability to discern those key ideas that they can uncover what it was that were those crucial contributions that historical human beings made. And so Cohen tries to kind of split the difference between Maimonides and Spinoza to have both an account in which you need a philosopher to help you read the Bible and to help you read all historical sources in order to at least understand their crucial contributions that, um, that they make 
kind of from one historical moment to another, but that this in fact dignifies the human being throughout history by showing that all human beings throughout history have produced um, brilliant and important and insightful ideas. So I kind of want to leave you with this to say that um, Cohen was really worried about Spinoza's, con Spinoza's reading of Judaism, not just because he said things like the Jews hate the Gentiles, but because he said things like Judaism has no ongoing meaning or relevance in the in the contemporary moment. And Cohen's project was quite the opposite, to identify these basic ideas, these crucial ideas that from the Bible and onward um, were the contributions that Jews made to um, the history of thought and to world history, and that these are ideas that have ongoing significance well beyond the text that they originally um, were in. And Cohen thinks that if you don't accept this premise, then you're going to keep having trials like the trial he participated in, where someone will pull out one statement from the Bible or one statement from the Talmud and show that it's really bad and 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 kind of try to take down the whole thing. And, and, and then contemporary Jews suffer because um, they lose all sense of justification for their way of life or their history. And Cohen thinks that if you allow philosophers to help you read these historical sources, you, you dignify um, the whole history of, um, in this case, the Jews, but also, um, again, I, I've shown that the method was, was much broader and it, it was meant to be used for, for studying all sorts of aspects of human culture. And that was his crucial dispute with Spinoza. It was really about a, a real disagreement of how philosophers should read the Bible and, and what dignifies the common human being, whether it's um, a simple it's saying that the Bible is a simple text that has a very simple message that everyone can understand, or allowing that it has a complicated message that um, you might need philosophers to uncover, but that helps you see that human beings throughout history produced insightful ideas, even if they weren't philosophers. So I kind of, pa I, I, so that's the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take more questions. Okay, I wish we had another half hour. There's so many amazing questions. Um, so, um, well, just super quick, people uh, wanted to know what the outcome of the Marburg trial was. <laughs> oh, okay, well, so yes, the Jewish community did win that trial in the sense that um, it was compelling that this was a case of, of slander. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so in terms of, um, in terms of connecting everything that you're talking about, and by the way, your your passion for your subject is is just um, contagious and uh, and very engaging. So thank you for that too. In addition to all of your expertise, um, and just this very very clear presentation of um, of some complicated ideas. Um, so if I if I followed you correctly, um, you're talking about Cohen advocating for you know, a nuanced view of the evolution of ideas and values over time, that ideas and words can't just be, you know, pulled out of their context and divorced from how those ideas developed, um, you know, over, over the course of um, broader sociological, religious, communal developments, and that expertise is required to properly understand the ideas found in texts. So it seems to me that, um, we could we could raise those same critiques of you know a lot of the advocacy for censorship going on today um, that we're you know things are not being looked looked at with expertise with nuance with um, with context and I want to know if you you know with this expertise that you bring do you do you see those similarities? Um, so I just to clarify. Um, a few things, and maybe, I, and I also want you to say more about your question in a moment. But um, basically, the Cohen thinks that that the, for example, the Bible was not written by philosophers. He thinks that the the, and he accepts the premise, by the way, of kind of modern interpretation that it, that it's a human document, even though he also thinks it's a divine document. But he thinks it was written by human beings, and he thinks the human beings who wrote the Bible were not philosophers, but they were 
profoundly insightful people, but not every single thing that they wrote was insightful. And just like every person, even the most brilliant, what it means to be a human being is that even the most brilliant is that you have some mundane and even false things to say and false beliefs and also many um, true ones. And what Cohen thinks is important about history is that um, you need to read things in their original context. So you, you need to do the kind of history that Spinoza is talking about, which is a very um, kind of local historical analysis in, of a text in its, in its own original context. Um, but what you also need, that's what Cohen says, which is different, is a is a is a a diachronic history, a history that goes beyond that context through time to see how a text has been received and understood and the meaning that it has had for people throughout history. And he thinks that both of those things taken together will help you see what the real insight is that the original people who produced these texts had. Um, but, and the reason you need expertise is not because the people who wrote these texts, again, were philosophers, but rather because in, in the present moment, the only people who are sort of trained to find these sorts of ideas in the original sources are philosophers, but not because you should need to be a philosopher. Um, again, the original sources weren't written by philosophers, but that philosophers are almost like tr a kind of translator today of what is crucial and what is the main idea and what has been the most meaningful in human history in these texts. So that's kind of one point that I wanted to clarify. In terms of the point on censorship, um, you know, I think that um, the key thing that, that Cohen, that the key thing I would leave us with about censorship is that um, in some ways, um, Cohen's work is an argument against a certain kind of censorship of of Judaism and of the Old Testament of, of the of the Torah in the sense that um, there was a long standing history of basically saying like this text is over this text um, had its moment and and attempts to kind of say that it continues to have relevance are are um, wrong headed and 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 problematic in in all sorts of ways and um, Cohen is advocating for a certain kind of um, non-censorship or of opposition by saying, no, this text needs to continue to be read and we need to read how it's been read. At the same time, Cohen is, is offering a really harsh criticism of Spinoza, who we already know has a history of being banned and being censored. And so in some ways, if, we're, if we worry about that, we might worry that he's going against the grain of, of this kind of um, revoking the ban, that he's saying, no, Spinoza is dangerous. But at the same time, the way that he's saying Spinoza is dangerous is if you read this book, um, this is, uh, oh, sorry, with my background, you can't really see it. But um, this book, the 1915 monograph, if you read it, you'll see that he argues against Spinoza and he argues about how dangerous Spinoza is through a really close engagement with Spinoza's text. So it's really the opposite of censorship. It's saying, I think this book is dangerous and the and 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 I read it really really closely and I'm writing a whole book that you couldn't possibly understand unless you basically have that Spinoza's book right in front of you reading my book to to see why I think his ideas are wrong. So in that sense I think that um he's um he's certainly against the censorship of Spinoza even though he thinks that Spinoza is dangerous and he's in favor of engaging um, with texts that you think are dangerous and problematic in a really close and careful way. Um, and at the same time, he's trying to expand how we read um, historical sources that a lot of other people thought were problematic. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're we're at the end of our of our time, and I want to kind of formally close. I don't know, we don't normally do this, but would you be willing to do you have time for a few more questions? Yeah, no, I'm happy okay. to stick around to okay, answer some just, more questions and everyone who needs to leave should leave. Right, because there, there are just so many rich questions that pertain so directly to, you know, major debates that we're really trying to think through today. So I just, today I just want to stay enough, ask some of them of you. Um, so, but in the meantime, uh, we want to, um, you know, kind of release people who have other commitments on their calendar. So I want to just thank you so much for this incredibly compelling and um, and and clear teaching of these, um, you know, you, you, 
these debates from a long time ago, you have just brought them into such a um, such a present context. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, I want to again thank JTS trustee Yael Aspel for your generous sponsorship today. Um, and I want to invite everyone back next week. Dr. Edna Friedberg will be teaching us next week, uh, December 5th, um, on censoring the Holocaust, how books shape our view of a painful past. And if you came in late, I just wanted to reiterate the announcement that the session on um, that had originally been scheduled for this Wednesday, November 30th, with Professor David Fishman is unfortunately canceled. Um, we look forward to seeing folks back on Monday. And, uh, and if you're able to stick around now, um, we'll ask a few more questions of Dr. Billet and or you can listen to the recording later on. So thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, and thanks again to Dr. Billet. Um, okay. So, so thank you for all of those clarifications. And, and that was a thousand times better than anything I said. Um, so I, actually, I, I just wanted to make sure I heard you correctly at the end. Were you, were you saying that um, just at the end of what you were saying before that, that Cohen would, would not have advocated for actually banning Spinoza's work or that, or that he would have? I just wasn't sure I heard you correctly. Yeah, so meaning I think what Spinoza, what, what Cohen says is that the, the Jewish ban on Spinoza was justified. And in that sense, he um, he he seems to kind of support the, the original 17th century Jewish ban on Spinoza. But at the same time, the way that he says it is through an extremely close engagement with Spinoza's text in which he's citing, if you read his 1915 text, he's citing huge block quotes from Spinoza's TTP. Um, so meaning it's the it's the opposite of banning, even though he's also in some ways defending this original Jewish ban um, in the sense that he's showing that he read this text extremely closely and carefully. And not just that, he's literally, quote, he's not just saying Spinoza says, he's quoting from it in Spinoza's own words. Um, and so in that sense, I would argue that this is an implicit argument against banning, even as he explicitly says the Jews were justified in 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 their harem against him in um, the 17th century. And he's against the rising popularity of Spinoza among Jews in his own time period. But at the same time, the style of his engagement with Spinoza is close reading. He actually taught a whole um, year long course on Spinoza's TTP um, at the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, a, a, a prominent kind of institution in Berlin where he taught at the end of his life, uh, a kind, kind of like JTS in the sense of like, um, you know, a place where people could come for lectures like this um, in Berlin. The building actually still stands today. Um, you could visit it if you go. Um, but in any case, he he absolutely did not advocate for banning um, Spinoza's text. And we see that by the fact that he taught, he, when he, if he thinks an idea is dangerous, what we see at least from his engagement with Spinoza is he wants to look at it head on and to expose the danger by actually showing it to you and by actually engaging with it and not by kind of saying, um, this can't be read, if that makes sense. Absolutely beautiful. Um, so I, I think that gives me the answer to my question before, which maybe I maybe I didn't ask clearly enough. But um, all right, this might sound like an odd parallel, but I'm I'm thinking about one book that has been banned in a lot of places. Um, you know, as part of this kind of anti CRT uh, critical race theory that supposedly is found in these books, where where it's not actually um, as as maybe a parallel to what you're saying. So go with me for a second. So there's um, there's a young adult graphic novel called New Kid, which is about the experience of a black um, boy who goes to a new school, um, a private school, you know, where almost everyone is white. And, and you know, it's a story about being a new kid in a new school. Um, but there's, there's, you know, one, one theme is, um, you know, how, how people relate to him as, as kind of different because of his race. Um, so, it's a terrific book, uh, won awards, and, and you know, kind of all of a sudden in the last couple of years started being banned. Um, so, so here's a text. The reason you made me think of it is here's a text that was not written by a philosopher, right? Um, and um, 
you know, uh, parents and sort of, sort of um, folks who are who are advocating for its censorship are are reading this CRT, um, you know, sort of putting the CRT gloss on it. Um, we could have scholars, you know, with academic expertise come tell us that's not quite the right way of reading it, you know, sort of unpacking the nuance of it. Um, so that, that, that was a parallel that I was, that I was thinking of, but it, it, it seems to me if Cohen were to join this debate, he would, he would say, you know what, if you're concerned about CRT in this text, let's talk about it. Um, if you're concerned that, you know, white children might feel um, accused of, of racism implicitly by this text, don't ban it. Let's, let's, let's discuss, is that there? And how do we feel about it? And how do we want to um, think differently about it? Does that, does any of that sound uh, yeah, I mean, kind of right to you? I certainly think that he would advocate for doing a kind of close reading and quoting and, and, and making um, real arguments for what one finds wrong or problematic. Um, but I would say that a, an even more core aspect of Cohen's method is you actually have to let these texts be in the world. And in 200 years or in a thousand years, you can look and see, did the ideas from this text persist? Did humans continue to, um, to take up some core idea from this text? And that would show us whether there was a kind of trans-historical truth in that text beyond its historical moment. And so in a certain sense, Cohen's method is you have to really let, um, you. It, it's something that it comes from history where texts are produced and then over time, things certain texts survived, other texts didn't. Some texts survived, but only but people only engaged with a few key ideas from them. They reinterpreted, they transformed. We need to see how things play out within human history, because he thinks that the ideas that survive the test of time, those are the ones that have a kind of core truth beyond their own historical moment. And that's the thing that, as a philosopher, he's concerned about. So I think he would meaning I'm not sure exactly what he would say about a particular book if he disagreed with it. I certainly don't think he would ever advocate for banning a book because he would say, let's see how it plays out. Um, so engage with problematic books by um, reading them carefully and showing what's wrong. That's kind of one strategy. That's what we see with how he reads the TTP. But more broadly, his method of how to read historical texts as a philosopher is specifically about how to identify what's true and what's the core idea in a in a historical source. And that just requires letting things play out in time and seeing how uh, generations of humans um, engage and the ideas that are that persist, he thinks those are the ones that are um, that ultimately kind of um, preserve philosophical truth. And he and 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 he thinks that overall, um, we we see a kind of progress in human, at least in Jewish history and in human history. But he also recognizes, and if you look, if you study kind of his history of ideas, that that these sorts of things are messy too. There's going to be progress and regress in ideas, and and that's why you need a, a wide enough swath of time to really see what persists, not just in a hundred years or two hundred years, but even through the kind of progress and regress. Um, to see what what remains, um, and in that sense, I think it's it's um, he trusts that over time there might not be justice in an immediate moment in history. People won't necessarily get it right in their own present time, but over a long span of human history, he does think that 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 people will preserve ultimately um, the ideas that are the most true. That's so helpful. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's do this because I don't want to extend too far. So I'm going to um, put a few, uh, just a few uh, um, broad questions on the table and let you choose um, what you want to address. And you know, in the next, you know, let's say five minutes, um, if that works for you. And the rest we will leave for the next time you you come teach us. Um, okay, so a few people asked about um, about. Um, biblical criticism and um, here I'll, I'll read what this one person wrote. I note that Cohen was reacting to Spinoza and what was the heyday of the documentary hypothesis. Is there a connection here? Um, and 
yeah, if we, if we sort of, I mean, really in light of what you were just saying, right, if, if a text that, um, you know, was tradition saw as being written by God, now we think of as being written by human beings, or, or some people do, um, how, how does that play into the, the dynamics that you were just talking about? So that was one, that's one thing on the table. Um, so also kind of in keeping with what you were saying that we're looking at texts that, that, uh, that we've had around for a while, um, people raised kind of how the Supreme Court is looking at the constitution, um, textualism, um, literalism, these, these issues. So I don't know if you wanna comment on, on that in light of Cohen's view. Um, and, and lastly, I'll just put on the table and, and maybe this is something that we'll have to have you back to, to talk about, but there were questions at the beginning about you know, this idea of um, hatred of the Jews helping, helping Judaism and, and Jews survive, um, the hatred and hating. Um, supports your survival, you know, it's just so, such a paradoxical and complicated idea, especially now with the rise of anti-Semitism. Um, so, you know, people are interested in hearing you reflect on that from our present moment. So I just threw a lot at you and I'll, I'll let you choose where to go in the next few minutes. Okay, great. Well, I just um, shared a link with you that, to something that maybe you could share with everyone. I don't know if there's a way to do that. This just on the question of the constitution, which I'll just start with really quickly. So in some ways, yes, um, you might you might see an analogy to a kind of originalism strategy of reading the constitution as what did the framers um, originally mean in their in their time period as the key to interpreting the text. That might be like Spinoza's strategy, a very look at the text in its historical context. What did the words mean in 17, in the 1770s and 1780s, et cetera? And Cohen is saying something that I think is more like this article that, um, that Rabbi Andelman just posted that I shared, which is by a contemporary um, philosopher and um, classical scholar and uh, politician, um, uh, Danielle Allen at, at Harvard, Professor Danielle Allen at Harvard, this piece was written in 2020. Um, she's a black scholar who wrote basically, my ancestors were slaves and the constitution did not think that they were real, uh, that they were full human beings. And at the same time, um, I love the constitution and here's why. And she gives a kind of argument that you might see as, some, as similar to Cohen's idea of like, what's the inner core idea? And she thinks that the inner core idea of the constitution is um, freedom and equality and is something that really enabled um, a fight against slavery, even though the original framers did not themselves um, have that exact view about the enslaved people in their own time period. So, so I think there are, the point mainly is to say that I think there are resonances to debates about how we interpret the constitution. Um, and even to how those who want to kind of contend with a legacy of slavery in America would interpret it. And I think what Alan is doing, or interestingly, is um, is kind of arguing a, for a positive message about the, a positive reading of the Constitution, even though she would say that, an, that she would argue that an originalist reading um, would be more problematic. Um, and of course, you could see kind of the opposite arguments as well. Uh, so that's just a, uh, to that point. To the point of, of, of documentary hypothesis and its heyday, so I'll say that probably many of you have heard of um, Julius Wellhausen, one of the most important 19th century um, Bible scholars and propounders of documentary hypothesis. So Cohen and Wellhausen were actually colleagues for um, I think a little over a decade at the University of Marburg. Um, where Velhau Cohen was there for his entire um, career until he retired to Berlin and taught at that Jewish institution that I mentioned. Um, and Velhausen was only there for a, a period and then he uh, moved on to other places. Um, and when and Velhausen actually died only a few months before Cohen died in 1918. And we have a published reflection that Cohen had on Velhausen. And, um, and he talks kind of intimately about how they um, in some ways, um, they had a very intimate connection. They, they both took a walk around the same time of day and they often you know, overlapped and they talked and they were kind to one another. But he also reflected on 
the kind of barriers that existed between a Jewish and a Christian scholar in that time period, that there was like a wall that couldn't be breached also. And he reflects on this in the piece. But the part that I think is most relevant to the ideas I presented today is he says things that are similar to what he says about Spinoza, about Wellhausen. He says that Wellhausen could not understand Judaism past the biblical moment. And in fact, even in the biblical moment, because he thought that only the Bible was relevant for how we understand Judaism. And he didn't recognize that seeing how these texts were interpreted over time is important for understanding the history of Judaism, even biblical Judaism. And so he uses similar terms about how you need not just philology, but also philosophy. And he says of Wellhausen that he, his views were really limited because he was really strictly a philologist and not at all a philosopher. And one key um, thing that he mentions in that piece is he thinks that Wellhausen really got Ezekiel, the prophet Yechezkel, um, wrong. Because um, what's interesting about Ezekiel, and I'll just say this super briefly, is Ezekiel seems to be like a moment of regress biblically, because you've got Jeremiah and Isaiah who fight against sacrifice, and they say the, sac the institution of sacrifice is bad. And that seems to be like a moment of progress in the history of the Bible, because sacrifice, the institution of sacrifice is viewed as archaic. And so we have these prophets who rail against it. And um, both historians in the 19th century and Jews think that Isaiah and Jeremiah are great because they show that even in the biblical moment itself, there is an opposition to this archaic institution. But Ezekiel comes after them and he reinstates the temple sacrifice service. And so he seems to be like a total regression. And um, But Cohen shows elsewhere, he has a whole extensive reading of Ezekiel how he actually thinks that Ezekiel was in some ways the most important form of progress because even though he reinstated the temple sacrifice, he also basically founded the possibility of personal prayer um, and of personal repentance, which um, would ultimately be the thing that enabled the temple and this institution of sacrifice to truly be overcome because they were the most adequate replacement. And so he basically has this whole reading of Ezekiel that even though he was regress, he made possible the progress that Jeremiah and Isaiah called for, but didn't have any institutional framework in which to enact it. If you were going to get rid of sacrifice, you needed to have basically the possibility of prayer and of synagogue and of a kind of prayer service um, as, as an effective replacement. And he thinks that Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel is the one who, put, who, um, who got that going. And that explains in some ways why he thinks that history is really complicated and you have to look for the long view. And that's part of what I was responding before, that you can't just look even in a short period, even in the immediate reception, you need to see longer how things really do play out. And that's just one example where he thinks that um, to really understand Ezekiel, um, someone like uh, Wellhausen needed to see how Ezekiel lay the ground for this ultimate overcoming of sacrifice. And then he would have both understood contemporary Judaism and Jewish history better. And he would have even understood his own subject matter, the Bible itself better. So that's that's just one example of that relationship. Um, and to your last question about anti-Semitism um, today and the kind of idea that hatred of the Jews preserves the Jews. I mean, sure, I do think that's true. I do think there's truth to that. And um, and in that sense, Spinoza is right. And I think Spinoza was right about a lot of things. Meaning if you read the TTP, there's a lot that is um, that is quite compelling. Um, and I think in certain places, Cohen absolutely admits this. And I would say just to the point about censorship, another value is that in many places, Cohen acknowledges Spinoza's positive contribution um, even as he's writing this really harsh critique of him. And that's another thing that I would say is that that's against a censorship motif because it's saying, I think these ideas are wrong, really wrong, dangerously wrong, but that same human being who wrote those really dangerously wrong ideas also wrote some things that were good and true that we should totally acknowledge. So that's just a quick point I wanted to make. Um, I think people like Cohen wanted to fight against the idea that the only thing that preserves the Jews is anti-Semitism. And they wanted to say that these core ideas of Judaism um, that were preserved in texts written by human beings um, were 
who were non-philosophers have real truths in them. And the fact that they have stood the test of time shows a linkage to God and to the divine um, because they're they're just so profoundly true. And, 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 um, and, and there's only a few really core ideas, but he thinks these ideas have contributed to humanity and will continue to contribute to humanity. And part of the job of the Jews, he thinks, is to continue to preserve them. Um, and so he wants to give a different kind of motivation. The reason the Jews persist is, is because they're preserving these crucial ideas that the world needs rather than because the world hates them. Um, but of course, th this stuff is is complicated and, and, um, and these are both competing but not mutually exclusive narratives. Okay, I really wanna let you go, but I can't resist because <laughs> um, several people have asked. Um, does this mean that we can't, people can't understand texts in their own time? If, if the, the Cohen's, this sort of test of time view, um, is, the, is there sort of not a, not a true contemporaneous understanding of a text? Is that, and what do you, you know, you have thoughts about the truth of text being produced today. Have, sort of where do you go with this? Yeah, so I think Cohen would say you could have a philological understanding. You could understand what the text means in its own time. But to understand whether it's really true, like whether the text contains really true ideas, that's going to have to be something that could only be understood through the test of time. And so I think that um, it's not that you can't read and understand. That's what philology is. Philology tells us what the text meant, um, to some degree at least, in its own context. Um, but Cohen thinks that the the truth of a text is is that's only one element. There are there are there are several elements that come together that constitute kind of the truth and the philosophical import ideas. And yes, some part just requires patience and, uh, and a long view. Um, and, and that's absolutely part of his, his message. That, I'm so glad I asked that because that was, that was just incredibly helpful and um, kind of helped crystallize your whole presentation. Many people have said JTS is so lucky to have her, to have Dr. Billet, and they are absolutely right. We can't agree more. So uh, we're so pleased that you joined us for the first time today and um, hope it's the first of many times that you teach in our community learning programs. Thank you so much again. Thank you all so much.